Good morning. Welcome to worship. Last Sunday, we had our first face-to-face -face service in our church building, and it was so good to meet together again, even although we were restricted in numbers and in singing. We are back online this week, but next week we will again attempt to have a service in our building. So if you would like to come along, please email me or ring the core office to book a place as for the moment we are still restricted in numbers. But please continue to pray for the day when we can have no restrictions, no face masks and be able to sing God's praises freely. The scripture says, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Let's sing a song together. It's song number 39 in the songbook. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, hail thee as the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the clouds of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. Let's sing together. Charles Spurgeon tells the story of a time he was out in the country and he saw on a farmer's barn a weather vane and on the arrow were the words God is love and Spurgeon says he spoke to the farmer and said what do you mean by that do you think God's love is as changeable as the weather that it veers about as the arrow turns in the winds. Oh no, said the farmer. I mean that whichever way the wind blows, God is still love. The scripture says, know therefore that the Lord is your God. 
He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. We're going to come before God in prayer this morning, but first of all, we're going to sing again. Song number 26 that reminds us of that faithful God. It says, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Let's sing before we pray. words in that song, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow, blessings all mine with 10,000 beside, great is thy faithfulness. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence this morning in the name of Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit. We acknowledge you as Lord and King 
And we praise you, not only for who you are, but also for what you have done and are doing among your people. We have fallen far short of your desires for us, yet you continually give us blessings. We reflect on the week now past, and we are grateful for the knowledge of your presence in whatever circumstances we have found ourselves in. And pray that we will know that presence in all our days to come. We also enclose within our circle of prayer those whose lives touch our own, work colleagues, neighbours, friends, family. And we remember especially those who have been bereaved in recent days. We pray your blessing upon them. And we thank you for this opportunity to worship today. Help us to relax, to concentrate and to learn. And above all, may your Holy Spirit empower all that's said and done. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For our worship today, we are using the prophet Malachi from the Old Testament. The book of Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. We don't know much about Malachi apart from his name, which means my angel. And he was the last of the prophets before Jesus came. There are 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. And a lot happened in that time, which we don't have time to go into this morning. We only need to know that while Haggai and Zechariah were sent to reprove the people for delaying building the temple, Malachi was sent to reprove them for the neglect of it when it was built and the sins he witnessed. And now that prophecy was to cease, Malachi speaks more clearly of the Messiah than any of the other prophets had done before. And he concludes with a direction to the people of God to keep in remembrance the law of Moses while they were in expectation of the arrival of the Messiah. And we know that God waited these 400 years till the time was right for Jesus to be born. And at the time of writing Malachi, the nation of Israel had strayed far from God. Evil abounded in the land. Unbelief prevailed. The majority of people had gone their own sinful ways, giving little thought to the will or the ways of God. They laughed at the prophets and showed utter contempt for God and his law. With that in mind, listen as God speaks to them through the prophet Malachi. Our Bible reading this morning will be brought to us by John o. Stubbington. John o. is our tech person who performs miracles each week to make sure our recordings are seamless, which is quite a task in itself. Sadly for us, this will be the final recording John will be making as this weekend he will be leaving Droitwich. And I wanted to take opportunity to say a big thank you to John as we are really grateful for the work he has done um, over the last eight months to allow us to provide quality recording for our weekly Sunday online worship. Nothing has been too much trouble for him. Jono may still be involved from a distance to help technophobes like me when I get stuck, but we will miss his presence here. And we do wish him the best for the future and pray God's blessing upon him as he moves on. Listen as he reads to us from the last book in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi from chapter 3. Today's reading is Malachi 3. 6 to 18. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? 
in tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be good in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord God Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed. For yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. You have spoken arrogantly against me, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? You have said, it is futile to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly evildoers prosper, and even they put God to the test, they get away with it. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honoured his name. On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, there will be treasured possession. I will spare them, just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Amen. That was quite a few verses from the book of Malachi. But to put it bluntly, the people were saying that God was insignificant and irrelevant. In other words, they thought that God was absolutely powerless to do anything about anything anymore. So as a nation, they were ignoring him. He was unimportant to them. But remember back to the beginning of their nation as their forefathers were settling in the promised land. Joshua, their leader, had challenged him. He said, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. And the people had responded. They said, far be it for us to forsake the Lord, to serve other gods. It was the Lord, our God himself, who brought us and our fathers out of Egypt from the land of slavery and performed these great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. And that generation of Israelites was faithful to their vow. They didn't forget him or ignore him. So there was no question that their forefathers, the founders of the nation of Israel, had a deep and abiding faith and trust in God. But by the time of Malachi, it's painfully obvious that the nation of Israel as a whole had turned completely almost away from God. Listen again to what God said to them. You have said harsh things against me. You have said it's futile to serve God. What did we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly the evil do us prosper. And even those who challenge God escape. That might have happened thousands of years ago, but it sounds familiar, doesn't it? Is our country, our world, going through the same pattern? But let's go on. For in the next few verses, there are some rather intriguing things said. It said, then those who feared the Lord talked with each other and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honoured his name. They will be my treasured possession, says the Lord. 
In the day when I act, I will spare them. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. That's a powerful passage. And it contains a lot I think we should notice. First of all, it tells us that in the middle of a faithless nation, God had a faithful remnant. Even although a great majority of people had turned their backs on him, God still had people who worshipped and honoured him and sought to do his will. There were not many of them compared to the nation as a whole, but they committed themselves to remain faithful to God, no matter what anyone else said or did. And while surrounded by the spiritual darkness of their day, they grew closer and closer together to talk with each other, to support each other, to encourage one another in serving God. Secondly, it says that God heard them. Well, of course he did. Doesn't the Bible teach us that God hears our prayers? We can all pray and know that he has promised to hear and answer our prayers. But wait a minute, because the Bible doesn't actually say they were praying. It says that those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. Even although they were only a small group of the whole nation, God was paying attention to them. They talked about him. They worshipped him. They discussed his wonderful ways. And as they did, God was listening to their conversations. He was tuned into their frequency. Kings were making edicts, but God was listening to his people. Generals were giving orders, but God was listening to a handful of his folk talking about him. Judges were speaking in court, but God was listening to his remnant. Politicians were making speeches, but God's ears were tuned to his faithful followers. Then Malachi tells us that the Lord enjoyed what he heard so much that he had it all written down in a book, a scroll of remembrance, it's called. Can you imagine it? Here is God summoning an angel to take notes, to write down what was said and who said it so that it would be remembered forever. Think of that. God really does hear and see what we are saying and doing. And not just when we are here in church or praying to him. And finally, notice what God says in verse 17. They will be my treasured possession. In the day when I act, I will spare them. You know, in the verse, the Hebrew word translated treasured possession is segula. And it's often translated as jewels or treasure. So God is saying that these faithful people are his jewels, his very own treasure. And he goes on to say that in the day when he acts, he is going to remember and protect them. And God makes his meaning very clear. When he says, and you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. In the light of that verse, I want to be sure I'm part of God's secular, his treasure. I hope you do too. But even although we call ourselves Christians, how can we make sure that we are part of God's faithful remnant today? We'll think about that in a moment. Let's sing again first. This song could have been um, the song of Malachi's people. It says, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand, bread of heaven. Feed me now and evermore. It's song 27 in the songbook. Let's sing together.
a good song, isn't it? Songs of praises, I will ever give to thee. Let's look at that passage of scripture again and see what it tells us about the faithful few and what they were doing. Well, firstly, it tells us they feared the Lord. They held him in awe and because of that, they remained true to him. It was a time when it wasn't easy to stay faithful to God. Corruption was everywhere, hypocrisy abounded, evil ruled the day. And we could say the same about today, couldn't we? You see, it's never been easy to follow God's ways, but God has always had a remnant. And this remnant has said, even though everyone else curses God, we will praise his name. They stood for righteousness in a wicked nation. They endured the ridicule of even family and friends. And God looked down on this small group of faithful ones and said, they will be my treasured possession. Only a handful, but what a handful. God's secular remains faithful in every situation. And not only was this remnant faithful, but when they got together in their meetings, they didn't spend time gossiping or criticizing others. They didn't talk about the weather or the latest episode of EastEnders. They could have, but times were too dark. So they talked about the Lord. They testified about God's blessings and God's presence. They spoke of answers to prayer. Have you ever noticed how eager someone is to talk about someone or something they love? For example, if someone is into football, they want to tell you all about it. They have a passion for the game and want to talk about it constantly. But it says here that God's special treasure are those who love to get together to share with each other the things of God. How much does your Christianity mean to you? Is it real? Has it made a difference in your life? Imagine if a bridegroom bought only one ticket for his honeymoon and he gave it to his new bride and he said, there you are, have a wonderful trip. But aren't you going too, she would ask. No, he said, I've already been there. You go on, I'll see you when you get back. I don't think I need to go on with that story. It's too ridiculous, isn't it? When people have expressed their love and commitment to each other, they want to be together, to share all they are with each other. In the same way, those who commit their lives to Christ, who become part of his bride, the church, want to be together and share all they are with each other too. And finally, we come to the last part of verse 16. You see, not only were they in awe of the Lord and eager to share their faith in him with each other, they honoured him with their words and their lives. They remembered the mighty acts of God. They believed what the prophets had said and written about him. The psalmist said, Blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. A lady called Corrie Ten Boom wrote many books about the time she spent in captivity. People would approach her and say, Corrie, what a great faith you have. And she always replied, no, it's not what a great faith I have. 
it's what a great God I have. And whether it's in the time of Malachi or here in Droitwich today, it's still true that our God is an awesome God and we give to him all the glory. Let's sing in closing song 279. It says, to God be the glory. Great things he hath done so loved he the world that he gave us his son who yielded his life, an atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord. Let's sing together. final benediction from the book of Romans. Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen.